Our next guest is named Rick Francie. He is the CEO of Critical Mass for Business, and I am so excited to have him here, and we can talk about today about his new book called Killing Cats Leads to Rats. And Rick, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be here. Thank you both. Yeah, thank oh, we're you. We're very excited. So tell us first of all a little bit about your business, Critical Mass for Business. What Critical Mass for Business is built on the power of peer learning. I believe executives can learn a lot from each other if they're in the right venue. And so I build mastermind groups here in Southern California for businesses with roughly two to twenty million dollars in annual revenue. Mm -hmm. I surround them with peer group people who can help them lift them up mm. and help them to avoid some of the common mistakes, unfortunately, that trial and error happens when you're making decisions and running a business. Absolutely, and it, it is hard to get to that, you know, that $2 million mark, right? And then you go to, up to the next hurdle of the $20 million, and, and there are different mistakes that right. you make each, t each time. So that's really, that's very exciting. So tell me a little bit more about your book. I've been giving a talk about the unintended consequences of business decisions since 2010. Mm -hmm. and Two years ago, I decided I was going to document the talk and put it into the book. Mm. It's called Killing Cats Leads to Rats because that's an example of an unintended consequence, not of a business decision, right. but of a decision made by that's a leader. Right. Things you don't think of that could happen if you fire someone or if you handle something a certain way. Or yes. What are some of the business decisions that, that you talk about here in the book? Well, we have a lot of, unfortunately, we have a lot of stories lot of, of unintended, con mm. unintended consequences in business. There are big company examples. Uh, one, because people recognize the name. And two, everything we wrote about in the book had to be footnoted and documented, and there's a lot written about Kodak, mm -hmm. Wells Fargo, mm -hmm. pick the names, Coca-Cola. <laughs> And so by learning what those big companies did that led to unintended consequences, it helps middle market companies understand, well, we want to avoid that because our research shows smaller companies aren't as likely to recover from the damaging effects of a, they don't have a hundred year history maybe, they don't have the mm -hmm. brand recognition of a Coke that can survive the new Coke fiasco. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they won't maybe be more damaged by the unintended consequences of their strategic decision. And I'm not talking about every decision that a business owner makes. But you know, every year there's a handful of decisions that really predict the future outcomes of your mm -hmm. business. Those are the ones that we talk about using the secure model that's mm -hmm. in the book. Awesome, okay, so tell me a little more about the secure model then. That was a nice segue, it was wasn't perfect. it? perfect. Yes, because well, I know you've got systems to help answer. Right. I know, I, my mind just went to all of, like as he was saying, like those names, like yeah. Kodak and Wells Fargo, my mind just like went, I'm like, oh yeah, I remember, oh, I remember that one too, mm -hmm. I remember that one. Right. So, so what is your model and like, first of all, before we get there, what are some of like the biggest things that companies do that have an unintended consequences? There have got to be a few that like, repeat themselves over and over again. Yeah, if there's, if there's, there are five conditions that can lead to unintended consequences. And that part of the book is built on research done by a gentleman named Dr. Robert K. Merton. He's one of the fathers of modern sociology. Mm -hmm. He created terms like reference group and role model, oh, yeah. self-defeating prophecy. He created those terms? He coined wow. those terms. Wow. In 1936, he wrote an essay about unintended consequences in large-scale social systems, right? Because he was mm -hmm. studying society. Right. His finding is, many times the leaders have an intended or anticipated outcome of their strategic decision, but all too often they're surprised by these mm -hmm. unanticipated or unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. And so he wrote about how, how they happen. So in the book we talk about the three types of unintended consequences, which the readers can learn that, the, the five conditions that mm -hmm. in a society create unintended consequences. And when I read his paper, I thought, what's a company but a small society. Mm -hmm. It has a leader, That's right. it has a hierarchy of authority. Mm -hmm. it, in a society, we have citizens. In a company, we have employees who are hopefully taking Dr. Merton's term, purposeful action to get the outcomes that the leaders have said they wanna mm -hmm. have. It's from that activity of the employees or the citizens where the unintended consequences mm -hmm. happen. But there are conditions that can lead you to unintended consequences. So knowing what the conditions are, you can then try to prevent them from occurring when you're making those all too important strategic decisions. Mm, very the, interesting. So can you give me like a little example? Yes. Um, okay, awesome. Uh, divorce emotion from your strategic decisions. There's a book by Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow. He's a Nobel Prize winning. Mm -hmm. He said you have two parts of your brain, a fast and a slow thinking part. Your fast part is largely experience-based mm -hmm. with emotion. 
which is great for everyday decisions that business owners have to make because we have to make a ton of them every day and you can't right. deliberate every decision, right. right? But on those strategic decisions, he found you need to use your slow thinking brain, which is the part of the brain that likes to deliberate, likes facts, is mm -hmm. collaborative, mm -hmm. willing to take in information that's counter to your experience and mm -hmm. your biases, but that takes energy. And many times, because business executives only have so much energy, they're not willing to input the energy in those strategic decisions, so they go to their fast thinking part, and largely they base strategic decisions on emotion, hmm. which is very unfortunate. That's a very interesting point. That's true. Because like, I because I could see a CEO saying, "Hey, I've got a great gut check," mm -hmm. and starting to like you know just fire off those decisions that need to be made every day. Then he gets to a strategic decision and he says, "Hey, I've got a great gut check," and it's completely totally wrong. Did off. you read my book already? <laughs> no, is that is that's it awesome. In there? You're like, yeah, you nailed it. <laughs> the, the secure model, the six step, the S is slow down the decision process. Okay. Right. Part of the reason why. Um, successful executives use their gut is because they believe in their gut, mm -hmm. right? But that instinctual action sometimes can lead them to bad outcomes. What we ask them to do in the book is give yourself enough time before you have to make a strategic decision to deliberate. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have the time, then what do you do? You just react. Mm -hmm. right. So step one in the slowdown is that be purposeful. You know, I have to make a decision. This is strategic. How much time will I need to really collect the information that mm -hmm. I need? That's where the sleep on it comes in very handy. At least give yourself one night between the decision making so that you can let right. your body and your brain check in together. Oh, that's yes. I, think that's I do that for of... all of my fashion purchases. Oh, do you in fact? Yes, <laughs> however, you know, I think I maybe should try the opposite because my purchases aren't really going the way that I, you know. Well, maybe just take a picture and send it to me and then I'll we'll do discuss. that. I'll I've do that. had this that's tie in the shopping cart at Amazon and out of the shopping cart and in the shopping <laughs> cart. So I did deliberate this fashion okay. decision. Well, that was a great decision. See, well, it's a but I, so I took my is. time with it. It's okay, so, but, but kind of like based on what Lauren and I are talking about, there's got to be some step in there that ta that says like gather information from your peers right? yes you're taking me right through the secure model and this okay. is awesome, awesome. you two are good. thank you no. <laughs> it's the next one which is called expand your knowledge okay it's the e in secure hmm. two things assess the information that's available to you inside your existing company it is amazing to me and the research shows that if the senior leadership of a company actually brings in some level of the line supervisors the people who are going to be asked to implement the decision, mm -hmm. they have a whole different perspective mm -hmm. on what that decision, when we implement it, mm -hmm. might require. So before you tell them the final decision, bring them in. Yeah. Assess the knowledge that's in your firm. The other one is to access information outside of your firm. Mm. Whether it's in a peer group like I lead, or hiring consultants who have experience helping companies just like yours do something very similar to what you're wanting to do, because right. they've seen all the landmines and they can help you to not make those missteps that all too often happen from those strategic decisions. That's right. Amazing. And okay. I imagine all of this has a big impact on employees in the end. So, you know, one bad decision, even a good decision gone bad, ultimately is going to infect the uh, affect the employee base in a and big, bad infect way too, actually. infect them yeah you're yeah. right infect them so how do you address that so that is the purpose of the book okay i think the number one competitive advantage that a middle market company can have is an engaged workforce when 69 percent of the u.s workforce reports to gallup every year in the q12 survey that they are not actively engaged at work mm -hmm. i think that's a big company problem mm -hmm. frankly mm -hmm. middle market companies can use the engaged workforce because when we as consumers see a company that has an engaged workforce we take notice because mm -hmm. they're rare yeah. yeah and to have an engaged workforce our research shows the leader the, the leaders have to be viewed as competent mm -hmm. i'm really the, no, she knows what she's doing and if you Tell them there's going to be the strategic outcome of your decision, and it's consistently different. The employees begin to think, well, does Rick really know what he's doing here mm -hmm. the last time? He and their motivation to implement with uh, enthusiasm your next strategic decision gets diminished, diminished, diminished. But if you can demonstrate that you can control your company's future within a range, they're so enthusiastic to want to implement your next decision. It builds that culture of performance mm -hmm. and engagement. Mm -hmm. It's the hardest competitive advantage for your competitors to want to copy. They can steal your logo, your website, they can copy your pricing model, mm -hmm. all that stuff. So they might even be able to hire some of your employees, but they can't create that culture of engagement. And so once you have that, it sort of self-reinforces as long as the leader, you're remaining competent and engaged with your employees. Mm. I like that. That's really, that's great.
It sounds this like is in this book as well. It's I, all I in that book. I got some good right? reading for me. Yeah. And it sounds like it's actually just good learning for life because all of these strategies, I can see them working with friends and family just yes. equally well. Wow. Absolutely so right. Good decisions are just good decisions and learning how to make them better no matter where it takes you, I think is a good thing. That's right. I agree. And so for our viewers, many of whom have retired or uh, maybe they are fully engaged in the workforce, what would be kind of like your final like thing to tell them to do proactively to help avoid these unintended decisions? Well, to, to the point that we talked about earlier, this works for any organization, a nonprofit, a charity, mm -hmm. a church mm -hmm. group, wherever you are, and there are people who are asked to take purposeful action, mm -hmm. Dr. Merton's term, right. to get this outcome. As a leader, it's really powerful to brainstorm this question. Here's what we want to get done. What's the craziest thing that could happen that we haven't thought about? Mm -hmm. If you make it fun, um, just the act of thinking about what could happen that isn't intended or anticipated gives people a license to be pretty creative. Sometimes those ideas lead you in a way you go, well, you know, that just might happen. Mm -hmm. We should control for that and just have fun with it mm -hmm. in advance so you don't have the pain of it after you implement your decision. I like that. Good advice. Wow, that's great advice. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. How can people buy your book? Well, obviously, they can go to Amazon.com, <laughs> and it's available in the big three, right? You can get it as a Kindle or an Audible book or the paperback. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Thank it's you, It's been both. really a pleasure. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Thanks, it. Rick. Great thank to you. see you. We'll be right back.